right. We are going, and if you're joining, we get started in a few minutes. We'll give some people time to join. I know we've got participants rolling in. As a quick intro, my name is Matt McAllister. I'm the head of restaurants marketing here at Yelp. I work specifically with the restaurant industry and with our Yelp for Restaurants team. Uh, we, we love these monthly town halls. We've had a lot of great people on them, and I can't tell you how excited I am to hear from Daniel. But we'll give everyone a few more minutes. Some housekeeping items as you're joining. Uh, we've got a lot of great questions that came up from people who registered to attend. Doesn't mean that you might not have a question that pops into your head as we go. So if you do have a question, a question about a question, a question about something entirely different, if you see at the bottom, there's a Q&A section. If you type in your question there, that is my sole job. I'm the least talented person on this call. I, I monitor that Q&A. So uh, feel free to jump in there, ask a question. And if needed, I'll interrupt Josh and Daniel and then make sure it gets answered. Well, also, we're going to try and do our best to make time at the end for a live Q&A. Obviously, depends on how much of these questions we can get through. We'll give another minute or two. I see we've got some people still joining. Uh, let, let's give 30 seconds and then we'll, we'll jump right in. So we got some great topics to talk about today. All right. Looks like we got a ton of people here. So uh, I'm gonna introduce our host, our hostess with the mostest. I am definitely the co-host and our primary host, Mr. Josh Kopel, who works with us here at Yelp for Restaurants. Um, he is doing some incredible work for the industry. Uh, he also, I think, has the best haircut in the industry by far. So uh, I'll hand it over to Mr. Josh Kopel. Take it away. Thanks, Matt. Flattery will get you everywhere with me. I am, uh, I'm so pleased to introduce entrepreneur and restaurateur and my friend, Daniel Shemtov. Daniel is a two-time winner of the Food Network's Great Food Truck Race. He owns the Lime Truck, TLT Foods, Hatch Yakitori, a successful catering company, and he has his own shoe line called Snibs. Uh, I invited Daniel to chat because this is a guy who walks the walk. He's bet it all time and time again and overcome overwhelming odds and more recently, a global pandemic. Today, we're going to unpack what it took to get where he is today and where he believes the industry is heading. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Josh Kopel. I'm a Michelin-rated restaurateur who spent the last 18 months talking about restaurants instead of running them. I've done this with a singular goal in mind, to figure out if there's a recipe for guaranteed success in the industry. I host Full Comp, a podcast that airs twice weekly, unpacking the tools, tactics, and strategies of our industry leaders. It's a selfish endeavor. I have the privilege of talking to the folks I idolize, and I only ask the questions that I want to ask. But the town hall is your turn. Today, Daniel answers the questions that you've asked. And I encourage you to use the chat function to ask questions throughout our conversation if there's anything you want to dig deeper on. We're also leaving time at the end for Q&A at the end of this town hall. So be sure to save your questions for that as well. With that being said, welcome, Daniel. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I'm so uh, glad to be here. It's awesome. All right. I'm going to share my screen. And we are going to get this party started. How are you dealing with the supply chain shortages and what are you telling your customers? All right, let's jump into it. So uh, how I'm dealing with supply chain shortages is different in each company just because um, the Japanese restaurant has highly specific items, things in my Cali Mex restaurant, less so, um, the catering, even more you know, of a variable. And so typically what I'm doing is I'm trying to source from different people. So right now our vendor list has grown by two, two people. So one more in produce and one more in grocery, uh, which is a little unique, but I have them on cash pickups. And again, it's not ideal, but it depends how important that item in your supply chain is. And then at the same time, uh, I'm just having our team tell our customers when things are available and when they're not. And so I'm going to use my Japanese restaurant for an example, because that's where I have the most difficult supply chains. Things right now are not making it on the cargo ships. They're being held at the port. I deal with my shoe company. This is like a very big problem for us. And our sake list went from 20 sakes that we handpicked to about 10. And people are upset. You know, why can we get our Japanese beer? What about the bean shotan charcoal? And in all cases, we try to find the items that are seriously important to us, like that charcoal is one of the most essential items for us to cook um, with on our, in our Japanese restaurants, the Yakitori restaurant. And so we found three other suppliers. And when we do find a good enough deal, 
we're hoarding it. So we actually have a little bit of storage in my commercial kitchen and I'm buying a lot of it uh, just to have, and then I'm, I'm giving it to my restaurant on a monthly basis. So I'm acting as if I was the supplier. Um, and so that was just really creatively looking at trying to find them. And then the rest just needs to be explained to your customers. Um, we have a couple popular dishes. And for instance, Japanese eggplant is no longer available. That's something that we grow locally. Um, and it's really interesting to run out of it. And so when we go to our customers, we just really nicely say, you know, we believe in using the highest quality ingredients. Right now, what's available in the market doesn't work. And then we, we now have a squash dish that we would like to offer you. And so with that sake list, it's the same thing. We don't have this sake, but we have something else. And so I think to the best of your abilities, you have to bring in the customer experience to what you're going through and then try to offer some alternatives. And if it's a non-negotiable item, you got to do everything in your power to find them and then keep a really hard inventory count. And we have a weekly meeting with our team. And on those items that are really, really important, we actually just check in on the inventory during the week because we know it takes a few few weeks to a month to procure some of those items. Well, and to, to dive a little bit deeper into what you're telling your customers, uh, I'm sure a lot of people get it, you know, but I'm sure a lot of people don't. And, and how have you trained your staff to deal with the, the disappointment or the anger in those moments? You know, um, we I, it's just really about explaining the situation. I think there's, so there was a moment, uh, if you guys remember, that was like uh, right when restaurants started opening back up and it was only five-star reviews on Yelp, Google, whatever. It was like a great time in the restaurant industry because everyone was really grateful to be there. And I think quickly we're back to the place where customers now feel like they have all the rights and the restaurants aren't going through all these challenges. So I think it's just a simple reminder that you want those products in your store. I don't like sourcing 10 different sakes that I, I didn't hand pick and spend years kind of procuring this list, but I do still have 10 options for you. Here's a great alternative. And I think by having the alternative ready, if you know it's a core item on your menu, you're telling them that you've thought about them. Now, if they're still upset, I mean, we have a rule in my restaurants where if they're still upset, it's the best time to grab a manager. Um, and the manager has a special training to either offer something free or to explain to them a little bit more in depth with what's going on from the back end. But I do believe whether it's our employees or our staff or our customers, it's all about transparency. And so if you go to them and you tell them exactly why you don't have the product and they don't understand, that's just them being difficult. And that's a customer that would be difficult anyways. I, I couldn't agree with you more. How have you adjusted your operations to account for these increased expenses? Oof, this is something we're working very hard on right now. So in a restaurant, your gross margin is the number you live and die by. I used to live by them separately. I used to say, what's my cost of goods and what's my labor? And I realized that that's not really as as it was five years ago when there were really clear borders. Labor has gone up, I mean, for me at least internally, across the board, it's gone up between 30 and 50%. So pretty, pretty drastic. And food cost has gone up between 10 and 25% on certain items, even more. On meat, it's been really bad. And so we discontinued items that I don't believe uh, match up to what's the value. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cost of goods, a little bit about labor, and then more about the gross margin. But there are items in your restaurant, like for instance, we have a skirt steak with fresh wasabi in the Japanese restaurant. And skirt steak has gone up 220% in the last two years. And fresh wasabi is $100 a pound. So this is an item that's extreme luxury. And we used to sell for 14, now we're selling it for 22. And we're increasing our prices. At $22, I still find the value of that little stick to be there because you're getting such premium ingredients. But there are other occasions where that shredded beef that we use for my taco went up 40% and now that taco is 650. Well, that taco can't exist anymore. Uh, $6.50 is out of our comfort for that taco. And so we had to either look to source another SKU or for the short time, discontinue it. And due to the fact that meat prices have gone up so much, and I think meat is more of a luxury than it used to be, we took meat off of 80% of our menus. Um, and so I think there's perception you can always increase your expenses, but, or excuse me, increase your uh, retail price for these items. But if the perception doesn't match up to it and the customer perception truly hasn't matched up to where our increased costs have been, you have to make that judgment call. Then when it comes to labor, and this number has been really interesting for me is I've been looking at 
what's overly labor intensive. So we're doing an exercise right now where I'm looking at each item on my menu and I'm looking at how long it takes to prep that item. So I take three different people and I have them do 10 minutes of that prep. And at the end, I quantify how much they're actually making. And I'm assessing what items don't make sense from a prep standpoint. So I've gotten really granular in my business to see where we're basically where the waste is or where I can get low hanging fruit so that the customer doesn't see increased costs, but we're able to become more efficient. And then I talked a lot about gross margin. So that's the, that's going to be the money that's left over after your cost of goods and your labor. I used, I now look at them as a holistic number. So I don't talk to them about what's your labor, what's your cost of goods. I say, what's our gross margin for the month. And if we're able to operate off of a gross margin, that's enough then our business can continue. And so it depends on, you know, every industry is different, whether you're in fast, casual, fine dining, catering, but a healthy gross margin is between 40 and 50%. And so in one of my restaurants, I did not have that. And so instead of going back and trying to adjust things based on food costs, which is what I would have done five years ago, I'm now looking at it from a gross margin standpoint and I need to buy, for instance, 15 points. That's what I needed from one of my companies to get to the gross, ideal gross margin. And so now I'm looking for it in different ways. You know, do we raise prices? Do we, uh, do we increase alcohol prices? How are we going to get there so that we can get some savings to increase our gross margin, but in addition, uh, raise our prices? I want to talk about buy-in for a second, because I think you're in an incredibly unique situation in the way that you are the business guy in your restaurant and you're the chef. And so when you're doing collaborative things, you are doing them within your own body. And so for, for the restaurateurs that are listening, you know, they probably work with a chef or there are chefs that are listening that work with restaurateurs. How would you go about getting buy-in from the other person in that party? Because there are so many times in, in my career, at least, that I've had that conversation and it, and it becomes dirty, right? Because it feels like you're talking about money and about profit and about all these things when we should be talking about values and service and quality. How do you, how do you reconcile the two of those? Ooh, that's a great one. So um, I hired an incredible uh, CEO in one of my companies and something that I saw him do that was really unique and I had never done it in my, in my past with my employees. Every employee that comes in gets to hear their career path from where they're at now to where they're gonna go. And because we've already predetermined some of the salaries for the career path, they can see how they move. And so when you talk about the buy-in, typically most employees' buy-ins are going to come from them feeling valued, them knowing where they need to go with their business, and them seeing personal gain within the business success. And so if you can show them where they can go, if the company is successful and we continue to hit our targets, they get a clear idea of their own path and then they feel like they're part of the bigger system because they want to get there so that their own ends are met. So I feel like you, in a roundabout kind of way from a macro perspective, you need to show them what they're going to gain once they hit those, those benefits. And for my leadership team, everybody is incentivized with a bonus based on profitability. And so if the company is profitable, they'll get a little bit more versus what they had. And I think that's really smart for your leadership team because they do need to buy in for you to be able to hit these targets. Um, and then, you know, sharing a company vision. I, one of the things that both Josh and I run our business on is a model called EOS. I'm sure you've talked about it before. And one of the first things you do with every meeting is you talk about company vision. And I'm going to rant for one second, but I, I had the most amazing Saturday this last Saturday. And I've been dealing with, a, I've been dealing with a culture shock. Um, a lot of my leadership team has been burnt out and moved on and we've had a, a bad cycle and, and really having trouble with retention in my, in my restaurant, like fast casual one and the food truck in Orange County. This past Saturday, the CEO myself sat down and we had a meeting with everybody. And I feel like restaurants don't normally do this with their lowest paying uh, hourly employees, but the impact it made to show them where we're going, what we're focusing on, what we need from them, and then allowing them to problem solve two really big issues in the restaurant right now, it aligned the whole company. And just that day, the productivity became better. It was, it was amazing to see that it was such a quick 
shift in just the, everyone's feelings at that store. And I was thinking about it as I was driving home because I was so jazzed, I was so energized from this meeting. And I realized that probably in 70% of these employees' lifetimes, they've never experienced something like this, where they had a big say. And I think we used to think, I used to think like, okay, your hourly employees don't need to be involved in these things. Like they're more just building part of the system. But everyone during COVID rethought their whole life. And they all said like, am I working towards a purpose? Do I feel meaningful in my life? And I think that was something across the board that doesn't start or end with hourly employees and work up to leadership. And so I think giving them the opportunity that allows for more buy-in from every level of the restaurant. And that's where I think you're going to see huge value. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It feels like customers have increased expectations post pandemic. Any creative tips on managing expectations? I mean, that is the nicest way that could ever be put ever. Right. Oh. Um, but there's, there's, there's a lot to be said for it, you know, because uh, you know, just, just to provide a little context here, which I know everyone knows to be true, but if the pandemic really brought anything to bear in the labor crisis, I think influences this as well. It's that the customer isn't always right. And that instead of backing up the customer, there's certainly times when we need to back up our team instead. And so I, I'd be very curious to know, how have you guys game planned situations like this? You know, this one is a tough one. Um, it, it feels like we almost forgot how much we appreciated what we do and the hard work that these people put in. I'm not sure you're going to be able to do that much for from the customer side because customers are customers and unfortunately there's so many restaurants for them to choose from that this is always going to be a challenge whether it's post pandemic or not um, but you mentioned something when you were sharing which is sometimes you need to back up your employees so what i feel like is maybe not to have an expectation around how to help the customer but more about how to assist your staff through all of this so that they stay positive when a customer comes into my store and they don't have the beer that, excuse me, when my yeah, customer comes in and we don't have the beer that they love, my employee feels bad because they're not able to give them what they need. But if we dive a little deeper, it's the supply chain that caused this issue. And so making sure our staff knows the reason why it's there and that it's not their fault and that they can only offer what they can offer um, allows them to feel better, which sometimes changes the customer feeling of it because we're more ready to deal with it. But ultimately, I mean, customers are the lifeline of our business, but at the same time, I mean, their expectations right now are, are really high and there's not much. You can do them. Sorry, I wish yeah. I had more insight there. But. No worries. Well, I got one more before this. How is How has your catering strategy changed post pandemic? So much. So um, I, it's funny in, in catering, typically a company will decide if they want to go towards like private events for individuals, like weddings, birthday parties, um, things that are more personal or corporate events. I personally have always loved doing corporate events because you talk to the client, oh, I don't know, one fiftieth as much, the <laughs> ticket price is more and it's a much easier experience. And so our whole company focus is, is uh, corporate. Well, that really bit me in the ass. Uh, my business went from doing about 3 million to under a million. Um, and the people left were the people who threw private parties or the corporations that the individual throws a party for their own home. And so I would say the strategy really now is supplement as much as you can with weddings. Next year is scheduled to be the most weddings in American history in, in 2022. And so if you can just get the low hanging fruit of every Saturday having a five or ten thousand dollar minimum. At least by the end of the year, you have three, four hundred thousand dollars in revenue before you go out and try to get those weekday clients. And so, even though it's more work than it used to be, um, I would say focus on getting the low hanging fruit, which are weddings, and then start to work back into getting corporations and, and other events. But if you focus on the individuals right now, there's less, there's more certainty in them actually doing the event. And then one last thing, but the other strategy is make sure they sign some kind of non-refundable deposit. Customers hate this and I get why, but there's so much work that goes into booking an event. And if you don't take that 50%, and I understand the customers may be pissed and you can let, it, let them apply it to another event or whatever you wanna do, but ensure you get some money for your business because that's how you're gonna survive. And as much as 
it feels a little sticky to do so, I strongly recommend it because you're not going to make it when these people are constantly changing their minds or canceling or things like that from, from the pandemic. Yeah, agreed, 100%. With businesses and fast casual, as well as upscale dining, how are you marketing each effectively? Mm, okay, good. So let's talk a little bit about fast casual. And then let's talk about a little bit about upscale dining. So with fast casual, I can tell you right now, marketing has been um, relatively challenging. You're really fighting a lot right now. So like Uber Eats, Postmates, all these delivery apps, they're, they're obviously well, the same company, but they're... Uh, They've, they've really upped their game uh, when it comes to this pandemic lifestyle. I mean, they, we saw a shift about a 60% increase throughout COVID of people ordering through those platforms. And so my suggestion here is make your food as friendly as it can be for those types of environments where these people order and order from you again. I understand they're taking huge rips from it, but I look at it as a marketing cost, you know, the 25 or 30% that you're paying these um, aggregators. And so make the experience really good. Um, you know, if things are, if you can rethink your packaging, if you can rethink the experience of what the customer feels like at home, I would say that's a focus uh, because the average ticket isn't high enough. Um, it really, that's kind of like the easiest low hanging fruit. And then try to get more from each customer. One thing we do in fast casual is we really push for catering. Catering is gonna increase the AOV on each customer by a lot. So that's a really easy way. Um, with upscale dining, I think it's actually easier to market this than it's ever been. People are dying for experience. There's a lot of money right now that's floating around. Give them an experience. I, I know that everyone's seen there's so much now going on table side. For like the last 20 years, we've never seen it. And now Salt Bay and whatever, whatever inspired it. There's things going on at every restaurant table side. And I think that's important. We don't do it because we're having labor challenges. But our experience comes in with having foreign food, like Japanese food that they don't normally see, really pretty plating. But whatever it is, really focus in on the experience and then showcase that experience. One thing that led to my Japanese restaurant having a 70% increase during COVID was that we showed what the patio looked like. We showed what the dishes looked like. We showed what the cocktails looked like. We created these like pop-ups that were different dessert experiences. We really created a lot around the experience element of that. And that's what really has been driving the restaurant, uh, the fine dining. Well, and I stalk you online. And one of the things that I noticed throughout the pandemic, uh, and I think that it bolstered confidence, but it's also just a great practice, is that in addition to showing food on its own and beverages on their own, you showed people enjoying it so that they could put themselves in that position, that it's, it's, it's as much about the experience as it is anything else. And I, I think that that built confidence in coming there and experiencing that directly, you know? Yeah, for sure. How are you compensating your team to attract and retain staff? We talked about road mapping, but does road mapping attract people? It does not attract people. It gets them to be the, the retain part. It helps with the retain part. Um, okay, so how this is a lot of a lot of work here. Okay, so how <laughs> are you? Let's not talk about compensation. How do you attract staff? You don't attract, so I went to a, like multiple seminars about hiring and the first thing that they said was, you wanna have an inspirational job ad. And your job ad isn't a job description. It's a marketing flyer for how you're going to be doing your hire. So for us, I was having the hardest time hiring catering staff because catering staff is its own unique item and it's not consistent, it's hourly. And people are really um, rather just go get a job at a restaurant, especially if you have two jobs, you need consistent hours. So what I put on the job ad was tired of making the same thing every day. And that speaks to a certain chef. Certain chefs do get really bored creating the same thing every day. And that's how we started to get ads. So really think about a clever way to inspire your people. For the food truck, I said, do you want to be a taco master? People who love tacos, that's who we're looking for. And so that was a way to get somebody to stand out from line cook needed $15 per hour or dishwasher needed. So you really want to do something clever with how you're going to attract them to click on the ad. That's step one. Now, how you get them in the space, you need to be aggressive. You need to sell them on the first call so that they want to come into the interview. And then from there, you know, compensation, you, you want to know what market is. I think 
we're all kind of paying around the same. So I think the compensation is not a huge factor of it. That's when I think you talk about roadmap. That's where you talk about who they're working for. If there's a growth, potential growth in the operation. Um, so this is a plug, but I give SNBs, my, my, I have a work shoe for chefs, doctors, nurses, um, and I give all my employees shoes. So I figure like it's a little perk to say that we care a little bit extra about you. And so I give every one of my employees SNBs shoes and they feel like that's a nice perk. Um, and then the other thing too is referrals. If you can get referrals from your existing staff, they're more likely to stay. They're more likely to be accountable. Um, and almost everyone in our restaurant came from somebody else in our restaurant that's still there. Sure. Today. And so I think that's a really important one as well. Do you incentivize for referrals? We do. We do. It's uh, 200 bucks uh, for the person who referred, $200 for the uh, person who came on board. And by the way, we're spending $2,000 a month on Indeed. So that's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, for sure. Next question is, what are your thoughts on reducing labor costs through the use of use of QR codes and other table side tech? Yeah. So it's different for different by different restaurants. For fine dining, um, I don't know. Personally, when I go to a really nice restaurant and I have to take out my phone and put it on the table, it's a not my favorite feeling. Um, I understand why they do it and you know, every each restaurant to your own, but I don't enjoy that dining experience. I like the physical paper. And even if it's a throwaway piece of paper, it feels like dining for me. And so I don't believe in it for the fine dining, but for fast casual, it's the one of the best things. We are literally like one day away from implementing it, but they did a study and most people don't want to talk to somebody when they're doing their order, if they know their order. They just want to get in, get it and get out. I look at Starbucks for me. I, I don't I don't know if your Starbucks fans are not out there. I am not a Starbucks fan, but the app is so freaking easy. And there's so many Starbucks around that I've been going to Starbucks now for like four months because of the ease of using it and just getting in there and getting out. And so I believe from the customer standpoint, if your menu is simple enough and you're not worried about the experience, I think QR codering is absolute. I, it will absolutely, I mean, from my experience, it reduces labor. It, um, you can do things like pictures and, and really make it engaging and uh, it can really help your business. And so we decided to, to, to use it. And most of, I think a lot of point, point of sale systems have integrations already for it. You know, I, I go back and forth on this a lot, a lot, a lot, because I, I think a couple of things and I'd love to get your thoughts on it. So the first is what if we're not able to lure enough people back to the industry in order to be able to operate in the way that we used to, you know, what if that, what if that pool is just smaller, you know, and then how do we adjust from there? And then the second thing is, you know, you and I are about the same age and the generation directly behind us, they see hospitality different than the way we came up, you know, for them, hospitality is I want to order a second drink. I want to order it now. And I'm able to do it in the most optimized and efficient way possible. And so through, through those two lenses, I mean, do, do you, are you open to other technological adjustments to compensate for if you're still short staffed a year from now, or if at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter to the customers because all they really want is to get the food. I think it just depends on, on your industry. I mean, so here's, here's the way I look at it. Like the first question I always ask a server when I go to a nice restaurant, what's their favorite dish and why? And I can understand in that moment, if this person is going to be a good shepherd for my dinner, or if I need to be the shepherd and look online to see like, what are the hits and stuff like that. So I think that QR code ordering could replace a lot of the staff, but I don't think it will be a, a replication for a good fine dining experience. I need to talk to the staff. I need, I need recommendations. I of course can sit there and Google everything and, and search it, but I'm taken out of the dining experience to do that. And so I feel like, yes, uh, I, I agree that it's, it is the future. And I think that we are going to have labor shortages. And I think for low end where you're not giving significant tips, it's absolutely necessary and in fact, better in most cases. But when it comes to fine dining where you're paying a service fee, I think you, I don't know, for me, it's just, I'm not, I'm not ready to say no to this or, or move over to QR code ordering full time. How has fine dining changed as a result of the pandemic over the course of the last, I mean, forgetting the pandemic entirely. I mean, you and I have been seated in it for quite some time. I mean, it's evolved a lot over the last five years. 
Yeah. Um, but coming out of the pandemic, what experiences are customers looking for? I know you talked about table side, but is what what does that one to one relationship look like now? Um, so I would say what customers are looking for is experience. At its whole, that's what they're really out there for. That's why they're paying me premium dollars. And so that experience could be introducing them to foods they've never tried before, introducing them to specialty alcohols, special cocktails, um, visually stunning items. Um, but I think they are looking for something unique. Uh, I think the, the kind of like tired uh, protein starch type situation is just not as desirable as it once was, uh, especially if you're trying to be competitive in like a, in a really big market. Um, and then I think as far as, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just really driving home experience in whichever way you know how. And so that could be really fun staff. That could be really great food combination of, um, yeah. Pairings. Are you, are you trying to get into more experiential dining where it's, it's a guided pre fees, anything like that? Um, no, not internally. I think your operation's either set up for that or it's not. And our operation isn't set up for that. So it's hard for us to do. You're all over social media. That is a fact, sir. Um, how do you create so much content without feeling overwhelmed? Who said I'm not feeling overwhelmed? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've actually taken a hiatus for like two months. But um, outside of that, I mean, I, I schedule it. So, uh, you know, at its simplest form, I have somebody who helps me with filming. Um, I come up with the, the ideas and then I, I schedule it out. So it doesn't feel like it's overwhelming. It just feels like it's on my schedule. It takes two hours a week or whatever time it is. And then uh, we go out and do it. So um, I think it's just about putting pen to paper and writing what you need done and then looking at your calendar and, and just kind of plugging and playing where it is. But I would say the same thing with how do you run five businesses at the same time? You know, it's like... If you, it's easy to get overwhelmed if you think about it from a macro sense, but typically if you look at it from a micro sense, it's, I just need to get X, Y, and Z done. I have seven days to do it or five days or whatever. How do I get all of that done this week? I also want to talk about vulnerability because I think that, you know, forgetting however much time the people watching and the people listening have to get this done. I think what stops most people is not really knowing what to talk about or how they want to be perceived or how they want to present themselves to the world. And should it be about me? Should it be about my restaurant? Should it be about my team? And, and I, I think you chose a really clear path in the way that like your brand is you and your restaurants are an extension of you. But in order to hammer that home, you talk about a lot of personal stuff and you do it on on professional platforms through those those mediums and you talk about overwhelm family issues the things you're struggling to overcome uh it's not easy and and, and i'm wondering how do you put yourself in that headspace to, to go out to the masses in such a vulnerable way thanks um for better or for worse i think vulnerability online is um attractive because I think we all know that that person who is an entrepreneur or restaurateur does not have a perfect life. There's not one restaurateur that's not dealing with all the same problems right, right now, but there are a lot who don't act like it. And so for me, it was, how would I want to get the information if I was watching it? And also like knowing that there's good and bad and that you can overcome, that's inspiring to me. If you know there's good, how do you know where the where the plateau is or where the inspiration is? Like, and so for me, it's all about like this is the kind of content I wish I had when I was trying to be an entrepreneur, and that it's okay to have bad days and it's okay to have good days as long as you push through and you stay focused and disciplined in, in what you're trying to do and you're clear with what you want. Well, and I, I think you're able to establish advocates, right? Like, I don't think anyone goes to bed at night going, "Man, I." I really hope Mark Cuban's okay, you know, but <laughs> I, I think that they root for us, you know, they, they, when they, they see that you're a real person trying to accomplish something great, that's maybe already accomplished great things that they'll root for you. Yeah. And I think transparency, I mean, really, we talked about this earlier, but I believe in transparency and everything just because that's the way that people can relate. What are some of the common mistakes to avoid when launching a new restaurant since you've launched 
a bunch of them. Oh my God. I could talk about this for like two days. <laughs> um, I think one of the first things is not always, but in most cases of restaurant tours that I know, it's always partnership. Um, it starts with partnership and understanding that partnership and understanding what the long-term vision of that partnership is. And also discussing what happens if you don't hit that long-term vision. I think that that was probably one of the wisest things I could have, or one of the pieces of information I wish I had when I started my career. And I'm grateful for every partnership I've had, but I've gotten much more clear in what I need from a partner and much clearer in setting our five, 10 year goals. And so I think it's really great to work backwards and say, okay, let's say this restaurant's a success. Let's use a crystal ball. What does five years look like from now? And that way you can see if you're aligned. When I started the food truck, the line truck, I started with my buddy from high school and we had totally two different visions of the company. He wanted to live above his restaurant, which he does now. And he wanted to operate and, and literally live and breathe one place. For me, I wanted to have a bunch of trucks in different cities. I wanted to expand, create, explore. And we were never aligned. And so six months into it, when I said, hey, I'm starting a second truck, and he goes, absolutely not. It was like a really clear that we, we didn't have those great conversations. My next partnership, something similar and different at the same time, but it was just really important. Then when it comes to actually launching the concept, the location, it's really important to get your finances in check. Um, you got to understand if your model is profitable or not. I, there was, I, I always remember there was this really amazing cupcake lady who had the best cupcakes I've ever seen. And she was right next to us in her food truck. And she would always be like, I'm really struggling. I don't know how I'm going to keep the lights on. And I sat there one day and I was like, you know, let's talk about it. How many cupcakes can you sell from your truck? She goes a hundred. And I go, how many, how much do you sell a cupcake for? She goes four bucks. And I go, so the most that you can sell from your truck is $400 a day. And I go, what, what are you paying for the truck? What are you paying yourself? And what are you paying for the commercial kitchen? Cause she had one. It was never destined to work. Now I know restaurants are much more complex. I wish it was as easy as a hundred cupcakes a day, but that financial model, that performa, that is going to ensure that you have a good plan for going forward. Um, so I think that's really important. And then I think, um, you know, I, as hard as it is making, oh, sorry. And then in the performa, making sure you have reserves, no restaurant hits the ground running. I've had two out of six openings open profitably and all the other ones took time to get to be profitable and some took years. Um, so that's important too. You need to have reserves because that's the reason, number one reason restaurants go out of business so fast and they always talk about it, but it's they're undercapitalized, which means that they didn't have reserves to see the good side. My Japanese restaurant started doing well about a year before COVID, that was two and a half years after our opening and did really well this past year. So if I didn't have the reserves for those first two years, we'd be out the game. We wouldn't be playing anymore. Um, and then when it comes to opening, it's, it's a difficult one, but I definitely recommend overstaffing and, and, and letting go of a few people when you actually open, because when you first open, especially if you're an established restaurateur, uh, you're going to have a lot of crit critics and no restaurant is ready to launch when they open. It doesn't matter how prepared you are. It takes time to understand your business, especially if it's a new concept. So, um, you know, having stacking the deck, if you have that pressure, just to make sure that you have a successful launch. We, oh, we, last, last, yeah. last part. Shoot, shoot, shoot. I recommend hiring a lease attorney. I had a lease attorney get me out of one of the craziest things because of COVID. And it was 10 grand up front. And I was like, that's a lot of money. I don't really want to spend 10K. It saved me 450 grand. You've also financed restaurants different ways. You have used investor capital. You also went to a bank. Yeah. Um, like a lot of people outside this industry do. And I'm curious to know, like, do you have a preference at this stage in the game? Um, you know, I've, I've personally funded, I've, I've borrowed, I've, uh, I've, I've raised money. I've done it all. Um, I think each concept has its own unique, um, unique capital needs. And also like, what's your expansion plan? Are you going to open five restaurants in five years? Are you going to open one in three years and see what happens? Like, I think you have to know what you're going to need. And then it is hard to get bank debt on a restaurant. Um, you have to have like existing financials. And then I personally guarantee debt for the first time. So when I sign a lease, I'll never personally guarantee it. I don't believe in it. And I think it's helped me a lot throughout my life in uh, the debt I did. And um, it's created new challenges for me. So 
I don't know. It's uh, I would say it's a mixed bag, but I think ultimately I wanted to get the deal done. And so I knew whatever way that I got the deal done, I would capitalize that way. Last question related to this is when is it time to grow? Have you jumped too early? Have you felt like you've jumped too late? When is, when, when have you determined is the right time to open that next space? Um, so I go through this a lot um, and uh, it's tough. I, uh, so I grew really big in my fast casual restaurant and then my partner unfortunately got cancer and it kind of shifted our whole landscape. So that was the right time to grow. We had two stores, they had year over year growth. We felt confident within our operation. And so it made a lot of sense that we were ready. Um, for instance, a more recent thing was uh, we were looking for a second location for my Japanese restaurant. And I said, I'm not ready. And they asked why. And I said, I feel for me to be ready to open a second location, I need X, Y, and Z. I need to see that we're making an EBITDA of this. I need to see that we have enough four-star reviews or five-star reviews about our customer service which we've been having some you know, challenges with and we've been lucky enough to get there. And that the team is self-sufficient without me or my partner showing up every day. And when we hit those three, like those three uh, KPIs, I'm comfortable to open our second location. And so we put a goal around when we were gonna do it and we started looking at sites before because it takes time to get a site the right way. But sure. for, for me, it was just, these are what I need to feel comfortable that this store is ready to be uh, given to somebody other than my full attention. Okay, I lied. I have one last question related to this. And it's, uh, it's because you've done both. So they, there's this idea of growing wide versus growing deep, right? Um, increasing profitability uh, within a, a single unit or, or multiple existing units versus simply opening new locations. Um, and, and I think that the pandemic really offered all of us an opportunity to really look at growing deep, right? How many different ways can I make money out of this one restaurant? Where, where were the missed opportunities for capital? What's been left on the table? Ha, has your perspective been informed by that um, as you look at growing moving forward? Yeah, it definitely has. That's a, that's a great point. Um, I think if you're sitting on a ton of capital and you have to grow, okay, that's, that's one thing. But I think for you to have, so again, I think it depends with your exit strategy. If you're gonna keep these restaurants forever, are you going to try to sell the restaurants? Are you going to do that? You need to look at what you want to do. But from there, you should want to be as profitable as you can per store. What makes you really valuable uh, if you want to sell? What's your EBITDA? You know, how many stores do you have? That's the next question. But, and same with franchising, same with all these different elements that you can exit a business on. So I think absolutely you need to look within. But then what are you talking Are you talking about counting, you know, like uh, the napkins? Or is that the kind of operation you want to run? Or are you su sufficiently happy with 16% profit? And now it's time to open the second location because I do believe that there's a diminishing return. There's low hanging fruit. You can get those. You can get your cost of goods down. You can get your OPEX down by switching credit card processing, whatever those things are. After a certain point, there isn't that much more you can do. And at that point, you should look at opening your second store because now you can have a new revenue stream and implement those things that you did to dive deeper in your business. Great advice. What would you, what, what advice would you have? <laughs> I love this question. Uh, what advice would you have for someone considering a career in hospitality? Oh, I love this. I actually think it's a really awesome time to get into hospitality. Your career can excel at huge rates because there's less people in it right now. Um, I would say what I would do is go test the waters, pick a restaurant that you love, uh, pick a group that you love, and then make yourself available to the leadership team. One thing that people haven't totally realized is the people who are paying the price for this labor shortage is your leaders, right? Because who, who has to show up when a person doesn't show up in your kitchen, your kitchen manager, your, you know, and, and maybe work extra hours in the morning when he went home late at night. It's always your leaders who are picking up the slack uh, and, and ownership, who's picking up the slack of the lack of employees. And so your leadership team is getting really burnt out. As soon as you go into your restaurant that you pick, you go talk to the leader in your department, whether it's the kitchen, back of house or front of house and say, hey, I'm here to help. That will take you so far right now. If the leader can count on you when a time of so much chaos, you're going to move up so quickly in the ranks and you'd be surprised by how quickly we're seeing stars. And that's the other thing too. Right now, the, the industry is so challenged that 
if you come in there with a fresh set of eyes and you come in there with the, the, the want and the will to grow, you'll get recognized right away. I just promoted someone to my leadership team that was there for two weeks because he came in and it was like, what can I do? I am taking notes. It's already fixing things in the restaurant. And I was like, this guy's an all-star. He already deserves to be at the top. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I went from it, it, the first place I worked in in Hollywood, it was a nightclub. And I went from patio bartender to general manager in six weeks. Yeah. And it's because it's because the place was an absolute shit show. And like, I was, I was just happy to help, you know? So I showed up early, I set everything up and before long, I mean, a month into it, I was basically running their business for them. So they were happy to give me the title. So I, I think there's so much to be said for that. I I'm sure that there are a ton of questions. Um, and this is definitely the opportunity to field those questions. All right, we've got we've got two great ones. The first one from Joseph Bates has to do with the more of the supply chain, its impact on the business. So now the question here is, where does it make sense to buy product pre-prepped versus have someone prep it? Um, so that, that's to understand the question. That might be a little bit more of a, a labor question and supply chain, but um, I mean, you got to look at what it does to your business. So. We, we went through the same exercise and we realized that for our pico de gallo pre-cut onion versus us cutting the onion in the store really makes no difference, especially because I have to wash the sulfuric acid off from the, the onions. And so they kind of end up sitting with the same amount of like reduced onion flavor. And so there are things that you can do that I would consider would be assisting on your labor. Um, and so I don't know from the supply chain element, I mean, if you think that it's uh, an item you can use and, and it comes in pre-made or whatever that is um, and you like it, I would say, you know, I maybe go for it. I, I'm a scratch made person. I mean, we make our tortillas from scratch, all of our sauces from scratch. So I have a hard time with the, those types of cutting corners, but when they do make sense, they make sense. Sorry, I don't know how helpful that was. I, I don't think- uh, That was very helpful. Sorry, that was my fault. Joseph chimed in. That was certainly a labor question and Joseph said, uh -huh. thank you. Uh, Mike Swan has a great question on ghost kitchens. What's your opinion on the rise of ghost kitchens? And then second part of that question, have you seen any successes when it comes to launching ghost kitchens, specifically with marketing? Yeah, so I am not truly a believer of ghost kitchens unless there's something very special um, in the mix. And I'll give you an example. Uh, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with Goop, which is uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's company. They launched a ghost kitchen in like three cities and they're doing between 10 and $15,000 a day. Okay. Gwyneth Paltrow company, they made deals with Uber Eats. They're at the front of the platform when you log on and they're making money hand over fist. I don't see it that same way for other brands, especially new and emerging brands. You're lucky to get away with 30 or 40 grand a month there. And for those who have ran operations that do less than a half a million, it's very tedious because you look at this, like, let's say you want a good manager and a good manager costs between 50 and I don't know, $70,000, let's say for that kind of concept. If you're going to be giving 10% of your gross revenue away to your manager, there's no chance you'll ever be successful. And so you're always going to be forced into this situation where even if you net 20% on 500,000, that's a hundred grand to run your whole operation. That's to pay you and the manager, unless you really want to be that person that's there all the time. And then when it scales, you'll have the same issue. And so I think ghost kitchens make a lot of sense for really, really nationally acclaimed brands or individuals. Um, I think it makes sense for last mile for like Rite Aid or ice cream companies or these big companies that have product that doesn't need anyone to actually physically touch it. But when it comes to an individual trying to use a ghost kitchen to grow and build a brand, I just don't see it. I have another question. So you've got a, a food truck, you've got fast casual, and you've got fine dining. When you're looking to grow over the next 12 to 24 months, what do you think is going to be the, the greenfield opportunity? Which tier are you looking at saying, we can go in there and we can knock this out of the park? There's massive demand and it's underserved. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty careful about fine dining because we haven't had a recession in a long time. There's been a lot of money that's been put out into the world. We haven't seen course corrections on pricing, infl uh, inflation. So 
I do have a fear that there could be something that happens. Um, and that is keeping me very relaxed and not aggressive when it comes to opening fine dining. At the same time, the moratorium of evictions has been extended. So we haven't seen the inventory of restaurants come online. Getting a site to, for those of who built restaurants from zero and those who have rebuilt restaurants that were existing, and I've done both, a lot of both. Um, rebuilding a restaurant that exists is absolutely the best thing to do. Right now, engineers are three times what they were. Building materials are three times or 50% more than they were. So the cost of new construction is difficult, expensive, and timely. And with COVID, like nobody's in these permitting offices. So I think when inventory comes on, that's going to make a big difference for how restaurants are going to expand because you can find a site to location and open for a lot less capital. Um, but I think that there's always opportunity in food trucks. There's always opportunity in fast casual. I think there is opportunity in fine dining now, although I'm not sure how long that runway will be. Joseph is asking any thoughts on best backed office software for small, but growing chains. There are two units now and they're adding a third in the first quarter of 2022. Congrats. Um, we use a system called often, um, and it's our point of sale system. I'm not sure it's better or worse than other point of sale systems. It definitely offers you a, a lot, lot more than toast and, and clover and all those other ones. Um, cause I used one of those in one of my restaurants, but, uh, that's one. And then there was a company, uh, no, often it's a U P H A N. And when we did our vetting, that was our favorite company. Um, the reason why I like them so much is the people that do the development and the people who sell the product are the same. So when you have something that you're like, Oh, this should exist. You just call often and they go, okay, let us work on that. And we'll get back to you. And their customer service is incredible versus like Aloha. It's like two different departments and stuff like that. Um, and then I don't use this anymore, but there was a system that we use called plate IQ, which was really awesome because it helps you with supply chain challenges. So for instance, an employee takes a picture on their phone of an invoice and it will tell you right away if something has gone up and how much it's gone up by. So you can be your own purchasing manager. That's really cool. And then we use a system called Jolt Up for operations. And Jolt Up's really great as well. Jeff is asking, can we still go by the historic 30% benchmarks for food and labor costs? Or are those unrealistic now with, with our currently increasing cost structures? Um, so earlier I talked about how I don't look at them individually anymore. I just look at total gross margin. Uh, but your total gross margin better be 40%. And if it's not, you better get it to 40 because you're not going to be able to operate anymore with less than 40, I don't think. And so, and there's so many new operational expenses. Like I never budgeted $2,000 a month for Indeed, you know, but I am. And because of all the turnover and, and the retention challenges. So I do say really strongly, and now I'm budget, budgeting for culture because I know that that's going to combat it. So I say, you know, strongly that that's kind of just how, how it is right now is you want to make sure your gross margin is between 40 and 50%. So try to get your labor or your cost of goods uh, in line to do that. And so for us, just to give you an idea right now, and in, in one of them that I, I actually went lower on cost of goods because labor is so high right now. So our, our, our model is that our food cost right now is between 20 and 22%, which is low, but at the same time, our labor is, you know, 38. So it is what it is. Marcus is asking, what's your advice for someone who's interested in running a food truck business? Um, most That's broad, but yeah, I mean, I I specifically, yeah, like three, three really good pieces of advice for someone considering it that they should look into. Yeah. I love the food truck business through and through 11 years in 12 years in, it's still the most profitable part of all my businesses. And it's my favorite to actually physically be on, which is crazy to me because I get so much joy out of that truck. So I'm a big component believer of go for it. Um, but at the same time, I think you really need to flush out your brand. You really need to think about your catering and how you're going to serve, uh, make your catering a big part of your business because that's what food trucks offer. And that's where I make all my money on my food truck. And then I would say the third thing is um, just a piece of advice, but lease your truck. You can lease a truck for three, six, 12 months, whatever it is. The cost to set it up is relatively small. It's 4,000 for a wrap, 5,000 for small wares. So for $10,000, you can get a food truck into the world and see how it goes um, and then work on it every day because uh, you're gonna need to learn if this is something you wanna do or not, because it's the first six months is like the hardest thing ever. And if you make it through that in a food truck, operating it yourself, 
Uh, I think you have a big potential for happiness there. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Daniel Shemtop. Man, you did not disappoint. Thank you for coming. So, so prepared, so vulnerable, so, so everything, man. I, I, I was taking notes through the whole thing. I'm sure everybody else was as well. Thank you, Daniel. Kevin Walters, to answer your question, absolutely. Everyone will be getting emailed a, a recording of this video. Uh, Daniel, thanks again for joining us. Uh, and we will certainly be uh, having a new one next month. We do them every month and we'll be announcing our guests pretty soon shortly. So keep an eye out for the recording. Feel free to share this recording far and wide. I think we all learned some great stuff here. Uh, and thank you for joining. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you, guys. Take care.